mentioned in your opening statement that you visited some 23 schools. Did any of these schools, principals, parents, students, or anybody whatsoever uh, within the school structure, um, give you their feedback or express concerns regarding pedophiles in our schools? Thank you for that question. No, um, the visits being that there were that many in a short period did not leave the opportunity for that type of discussion. Um, we know we've heard some uh, had a report of at least one arrest in a case of, of um, pedophiles in our school system. The thing I would like to say to the general public as well as the school teachers is to be very much aware of changes in behavior in children and report because we do have the facilities to deal with situations. This child, the child the victim is always protected and a lot of times children don't speak out because they are afraid. So we did not get to touch on that topic, but I'm glad you brought up concerns. Um, you mentioned one, but there are several within the education system which have my attention. Um, several years ago while I was minister, we held teacher conferences, management conferences and the like. And we, I have some people working on a project within the cabinet at this moment, compiling the suggestions that had come from the teachers, managers, etc., school boards, and they are looking at what has actually been executed over the past two and a half years, where we are, and um, having those teachers, not in another conference, but I will send the document to the schools to have them evaluate what is still a priority for them, where we need to focus our interest, because we do have a governing program which focuses on um, education, the rights of our children to be educated properly, to be exposed to sports and culture. Um, it is part of our curriculum even, but how much of it can be executed given our financials? Um, making an environment where teachers can work because of course an unhappy teacher is an unhappy classroom and that also has my priority. So there are many, many areas that I believe we need to tackle. But where it comes to the protection of children, the laws are very clear on that. And the reporting system, actually the youth department, together with Justice and uh, VSR, are working out a protocol which is almost completed. I didn't want to speak about it because it's not finished yet. But they have been diligently working for the past two years on this. So this was an init initiative from back then that these people work together and it comes also, also out of the UNICEF reports and the rights of the child convention. So reporting on abuses, child abuse, of which sexual abuse is one of them, is part of that protocol. We have now the justice chain has improved somewhat in a sense of the reporting, the Vogdairat is the place to bring your complaints, as well as the court of guardianship, sorry, in English, um, under Mrs. Richella Rodriguez Emanuel. Um, if people have been paying attention, there have been much information given out on this topic. There have even been discussions within the communities. And before becoming a minister, I attended one in Belvedere, and there were five participants. Five. So I believe the public now has to show their interest and come out to these information sessions because there's not all the information cannot be given in a press briefing. The specific stakeholders who carry out the controls, who tell you what happens next when a case of child abuse is reported, have come out to the different um, communities, and I would then encourage them to look out for when the next one is. It's usually in the newspapers and in the bulletin board, and come out and see what you can do in terms of early detection, in terms of reporting, so that we can protect our young. Definitely, this ministry does not condone any type of abuse against children, any kind. Thank you, Minister Jacobs. I'll come back to you in my second round with another question. I now move to the Prime Minister. When you first uh, got sworn in a couple of weeks ago, uh, in the very first press briefing, you stated that this cabinet has requested um, an inventory on all of the decisions taken by the ousted GUMS cabinet, especially those decisions taken after September 30th. Have you received those decisions and can you shed light on some of the things that took place within the seven week period when government was held hostage? Uh, thank you. I did mention, I think it was in the first press briefing that we have received uh, from the Minister, Ministry of Romi 
we had received. I don't know if the other ministries have received uh, that list uh, because there are two sets of decision that are taken. Decisions that are taken in the Council of Ministers and decisions that are taken by the minister. Uh, a minister can take decisions by ministerial decree that do not appear in the Council of Ministers um, and we have not yet um, received, I think, I think, all of the updates. What we have received back then uh, were decisions from the Council of Ministers and I've shared some of that already in previous press briefings. Um, the garbage contracts, for instance, was one of them that we have spoken about. Uh, the forcing is one of it that we have spoken about. Uh, there are several issues, but uh, for the past uh, week, I personally have been uh, focused on other issues and did not uh, delve into that. In the discussion, for instance, with the, with the shareholders, uh, in the shareholders meeting with GBE yesterday, um, one of the issues that was brought up was the visit um, to uh, Port St. Lucie, where members of uh, the board, um, the minister, and I'm not too sure if uh, the then um, manager of GEBE went along. Um, as you know, it's a discussion that started in Parliament. Um, the meeting was never concluded, uh, but in that meeting, uh, the leader of the UP party um, sort of preempted answers uh, for the then Minister Claret Connor. What we were made to understand yesterday from the board, and they didn't altogether seem to be clear on it, um, was that uh, Minister Claret Connor, it would appear like he got an office on, on Monday, and on Monday night he got an invitation from these people. Um, so Minister Claret Connor invited the board of GBE and management to go along with him. Uh, we can recall then that the leader of the UP said in parliament that he happened to be in Florida and happened to give the minister a ride to a presentation. Um, why I'm bringing this up, I mentioned it uh, briefly, I think, in my opening statements about uh, the manner in which certain things uh, happen and uh, decision-making not properly prepared. Here it is, the minister claims to have gotten an invitation from a company uh, that says, we have a facility that works, that, 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 that uh, deals with generating of electricity waste to energy, um, and we want to make you a proposal. So we're inviting you to come. Within 24 hours of taking office as minister, he and a delegation from GEBE rush off to Port St. Lucie uh, to see what or to do what. And the Minister of Finance rightfully you know, questioned, um, is every invitation that comes in that you react and jump on a plane and go to sea? One of the other issues that we will be addressing with them tomorrow, uh, and, 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 and that applies across the board to government-owned companies, is the, the non-separation of authority between the boards, management, and sometimes even uh, a minister. Um, we see that uh, with, 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 with a harbor boards, for instance, going um, in 100% in of the board, uh, sometimes going to the FCC a conference. Uh, what is the board doing there? What is the added value of the board doing there? The board has to supervise management. And in this case, if management of GBE is negotiating or not um, with a company as to the possibility of uh, building a waste energy plant on St. Martin, the board has no business in that meeting. It is management that has to run the company. It is management that has to do its job. Management would have to negotiate or hold discussions and then present a proposal to the board saying, this is how we want to move forward. Do you agree or do you not agree? 
not management and board and minister running off to see a plant and to seemingly jointly hold discussions. And at the end of the day, the question would then be, who is managing, who is supervising? There is no clear uh, 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 separation of, of, of powers and authority when we look at how some of these companies are operating. So to get back to the uh, original question, uh, if I have a listing, for instance, here of um, issues that we found that we have overturned, um, no update because some of them I've already mentioned and one of them uh, that is being worked on as well is the decision of government of the minister of Romi uh, to give the, the land that was destined for um, public parking there in the back of um, the former theater, the former movies there in the back of Toppers where government um, several years ago when the last parcels of land there were given out. Uh, I was commissioner at the time, I can recall, and uh, a sizable parcel of land was earmarked and was subsequently um, in the planning permit reserved for public parking. So legally, the minister had no authority to give that land to Port de Plaisance for Port de Plaisance uh, for, for Port de Plaisance, period, to expand on the made brief that they have there <coughs> adjacent to it. It is land that is earmarked for public parking, and that is what it has to be used for. Uh, the, they, have, they have attempted to rush this off also and take to the notary and finalize uh, before the new government comes in, but it has been blocked uh, so far, and we are busy um, turning those decisions back. Uh, there are some other um, smaller issues that you know the individual ministers are dealing with, but I don't have a listing with me. Okay. Um, question number three: The prison. The former minister of justice said that they were going to give a contract for the expansion of the prison to Leakum for 13 million. This was not placed in bid. Uh, will the minister be, do you know if that contract was granted? If it was granted, will the minister be held personally liable for his decisions? And the same goes for the minister of Romy, who did things uh, his way. Will he be led, held liable? Uh, for the legal things or alleged legal, legal things, things that not following procedures? The focus of the government so far has not been on uh, trying to prosecute any former minister. Um, our focus has been on getting things done. Uh, and for me personally, on behalf of the Council of Ministers, I've spent a lot of time and energy on the decree that is now uh, signed into, in, in, into law. What I do know about the prison is that a decision indeed was taken, mm -hmm. but that decision uh, has not been carried out, and that decision will be reversed by the present government. Uh, the manner in which it was done um, is not uh, following proper procedures. Uh, we don't believe that, well, we don't believe, we do, we do not agree with the fact that a contractor uh, had a million guilder job to do. I've compared this in a previous press briefing, I believe, uh, where I said it's like giving somebody um, a bathroom to repair in a house and you put it on public bid and once that person wins uh, the bid to fix the bathroom, then you, after they complete it, give them a contract now for 13 million to upgrade the prison. Um, that is not following proper procedure. Thank you. Thank you very much for your questions, B.B. Hilbert Har. Today newspaper, you have the floor. Yes, thank you. Good morning. Uh, Prime Minister, uh, one question about uh, electoral reform. Do you think that um, there is enough time mm -hmm. to put something in place before the elections in September? Because to me, the time frame seems very narrow, but maybe you have a different opinion about that. The, the time frame... Um, the time period will indeed, will, will indeed seem short, uh, but if we, the electoral reform 
can be completed in time for the elections. Uh, once, as I've said, if there is a will, there is a way. Uh, if others involved in the process, um, the government, and if there's a decision of parliament to be taken, I'm con con convinced that it can be done. There are some other issues uh, that we need to address, uh, which would call for the change of the Constitution. And that is a process that may take several years. Uh, the possibility is that it can be done uh, in a year, a year and a half, two years. I do not know. But one of the things that uh, we didn't want to happen was to create the impression as if the government uh, was trying to circumvent uh, the elections. We can argue uh, from today until September 26, or we can argue from today until uh, 2018 about the, the decision and how the decision was arrived at to dissolve parliament in the first place. Um, there is a big difference of opinion between um, some in Europe, and, and I say some because Professor Hirsch Berlin uh, who is a former Minister of Justice, who is a present constitutional law professor in, in the Netherlands, but also in, in the rest of Europe, in other countries in Europe, has written an opinion, a short opinion, to then Minister Marcel Gums telling him uh, what they are doing is wrong. A, he should resign, and after they have received a motion of no confidence, uh, their authority to take uh, such decisions uh, no longer uh, is there. Um, but we also have constitutional experts in the Dutch Caribbean, and one who we have consulted, Dr. Ritzel Marta, uh, who now has a law practice in, uh, mm -hmm. in London. He is, he is of the opinion, in an advice that he has written to us, uh, we did not publish it, um, in an advice that he has written to us, which was the basis also <coughs> that we used to move forward. And in his opinion, uh, the... Uh, national decree to, 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 to have elections on the 9th of February, he said, is one that could have been uh, revoked completely um, and replaced with a new decree whenever constitutional reform was, was, was completed. Now that, if you interpret it that way, it could have been, if you finish it in six months, then you hold elections. If it's after a year, you hold elections. After two years, you hold elections. But then the question would be, okay, so if it's not finished by 2018, what do you then do? Uh, so we have agreed uh, to hold elections um, in September. We are confident that we would have sufficient electoral reforms in place uh, to at least stem ship jumping and regulate some other issues that needed regulating. Uh, so in the coming weeks, you will be hearing more from the committee. Uh, well, not from the committee. We will establish a committee, but you will definitely be hearing uh, more from me as minister uh, in charge of electoral reform. As I said, I have some ideas already, and you will be hearing them shortly. Yeah. Second question, who will be on that committee? Uh, the persons have not yet been appointed. Oh, okay, thank It's you. an appointment that will take place next week, okay. most likely. The following message is an important notice for all foundations, associations, and trusts. In connection with the change in the profit tax legislation, Article 1 of the Profit Tax Ordinance as amended in AB 2014-7, all associations, trusts, and foundations, other than those exclusively serving a general public interest, are taxable with profit tax as of January 1, 2015, even when the entity is not conducting a business. As a result, the above-mentioned entities must file their profit tax returns as of fiscal year 2015. The provisional profit tax return must be submitted before April 1, 2016, and a final profit tax return must be submitted before July 1, 2016. A copy of the financial statements for the relevant year must be submitted with the final tax return. The tax forms will be available online as of February 1, 2016 via the following website online services.stmartingov.org that once again is online services.stmartingov.org
Failure to file the tax returns can result in a fine of up to 2,500 guilders. The Tax Administration urges all foundations, associations and trusts that have not yet registered at the Tax Administration to do so as soon as possible in order to avoid fines. For more information, you can contact the Tax Administration Inspectorate Department at 542-2143. 542 5301, 542 5304, 542 or email taxinfo at This public service announcement was brought to you by the Tax Administration, Sit Martin. One question for uh, Minister Lee um, Do you have an insight in how many? Uh, residents on the island are uh, do not have health insurance and that is something that affects especially uh, children in in uh, broken families no at, at this stage um, you know in general um, my experience in the short time that I'm here so far is that in general the quality of data available in st. Martin is is poor um, you know, for example, as we as we look at designing the hospital, um, or or planning the the needs for the healthcare system for St. Martin, mm. just getting data in terms of um, you know what sort of illnesses live in the community in terms of frequency or in terms of cost, that data really is is not not there. So, for example, when um, when consultants were designing the hospital, they actually took information from a city in Holland and use that to extrapolate to uh, what we're doing here in St. Martin. So just to give you an idea that the, the quality of the, of the data is poor and that's definitely one of the things that needs to be emphasized going forward is, is gathering that, that quality information. But certainly um, having the population with proper health insurance in place is, is a critical fact. Uh, in terms of maintaining the, the the health of the general health of the population, so. But isn't that something that could be uh, filtered out from data from uh, SSV and the census office, for instance? The health insurance issue. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's possible. Again, even my discussions with SSV so far, some of the data that you would think would be readily available is is not. Mm -hmm. So, that will be one of the things uh, as a priority going forward, for sure. Okay, M my last question is about the, the level of enthusiasm within the Council of Ministers for your uh, 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 support for open government. Uh, are other ministers, uh, do they tend to follow your example, or has it not happened? Uh, I think they could speak for themselves, but I think in general, the, the level of support from within government has, has been tremendous. As, mm -hmm. I, as I mentioned, I'm very happy with the the, um, with the SSV, you know, so as, as we talk about the process of filling board positions, they've been open. As we talk about the process of um, designing, engineering, building the hospital, they're also very open to the idea of, of, of incorporating the ideas of transparency and open government in that process. Um, I think that the Council of Ministers, in my discussions with them, have been very supportive of everything that I've been doing, and in, I think that. Uh, uh, it's up to them to account. Yeah. yeah, we've been in supportive of each other, but it, for as to how they perform their their specific functions, they need to answer for themselves. Yeah. Okay. Hilbert. Do you want to say no. something? About, well, my time is up. Right. <laughs> <laughs> they probably can chime in in the second round. Um, thank you very much for your questions, Hilbert. Andrew Dick, Daily Herald, you have the floor. Good morning, um, Minister Jacobs. The NIPA, um, do you have an update for me on that? Um, we know that um, you were very critical of NIPA during, while you was in Parliament. Um, now, as Minister of Education, you said you was going to um, handle the issue. Um, you recently attended a graduation there also. So um, how is it going so far, and are there, is there any progress in that? I guess I should have expected that question. Um, I don't have the data in front of me pertaining to NIPA at this time, but I can inform you that the former minister and the ministry had initiated a, how should I say, a sequence of events to come to a decision. Um, a deadline was passed on the 16th, I believe, an extension, no, it was a bit earlier, an extension was granted until the 18th, so NIPA has to provide some information um, to the ministry by 
this Friday, I believe, the 18th is a Friday. Um, several attempts at open dialogue have not come forward. Um, that was initiated by my person and the ministry. The ministry that is responsible, the parts of the ministry, so inspectorate continues to do what they have to do. Uh, data is being collected. We've also received uh, legal advice in terms of moving forward. And as soon as um, they have provided the information at the end of the week, then we will know how we will proceed after that. Until then, um, it is still very, very important to me. Yes, I did um, attend the graduation. As a matter of fact, many of the graduates were persons who had complained to us in Parliament and were finally able to graduate. Um, the ministry had to also play a huge role in validating the diplomas, and the ministry of ASI had to assist also with the, what had to be done so that the nurses could be pinned. This is the first time that it's happened on St. Martin, so you can understand to some extent that uh, the institution was not completely prepared, but um, many of the challenges still continue at the, at the NEPA, and we, it, it is one of our priority areas, but I would refrain from stating exactly what is being done at this time as we are awaiting certain documentation and the legal advice from within government organization has to be finalized before I can go there. But you still believe in the program? Of course, the program, the idea, <laughs> the idea of the NIPA providing St. Martin students who leave the vocational streams as well as adult persons who are already in the field to be able to have that opportunity to become professionals in their fields is a priority for this ministry. Sadly, it has not been executed as has been planned. So we have to evaluate. What I must say is um, given time, certain things have improved. But overall, uh, definitely communication and openness has not improved. And that has a, is a serious concern. As the minister responsible for education, at the end of the day, there's only so much distance you can take.